In the year of our Lord 878, King Alfred and his court visited the royal estate at Chippenham. Alfred had good cause to look forward to the forthcoming Christmas celebrations. His enemies, the Danes, had suffered calamitous losses when their fleet had been caught in a terrible storm. The Danish leader, Guthrum, had sworn oaths and given hostages in exchange for peace. As his household celebrated Twelfth Night, a breathless messenger brought dire news. King Alfred's army had been disbanded for Christmas. Now he was defenseless. A mounted force of Danes had crossed into Wessex and in a lightning march were already approaching King Alfred's stronghold. At a stroke and without a battle, the Danes had defeated him. Gathering together his household retainers, King Alfred prepared to flee. His fortunes reached their lowest ebb. But King Alfred, although defeated, was not finished. Despite privation and hardship, he would return victorious. The legacy he would leave his people would truly earn him his nickname, Alfred the Great. The story of King Alfred is a story of triumph over constant adversity. His reign saw his kingdom of Wessex snatched from him, then regained and expanded. The desperate struggle against the fearsome Viking invaders led eventually to the foundation of the English state. Whenever he was confronted with difficulties, King Alfred found practical solutions. His achievements in many fields contributed greatly to the future success of his country. Wisdom, humility, caution, moderation, fairness, mercy, Restraint, loyalty, generosity, chastity, and continence. With these anchors, you should fix your cable to God to hold the ship of your mind. Faith, hope, and charity. These are the three anchors which protect the ship of your mind in dangerous seas. The land into which Alfred was born in 849 was green and fertile, but life was hard for people wholly dependent on the weather to nurture their crops and livestock. Small, scattered farming communities scratched a living from the rich soil using tools still recognizable today. Woodland was important for timber, fuel, and pasturing pigs. Larger communities formed towns usually sited close to rivers for trading and transportation. England was divided into kingdoms, each ruled over by its own royal house. These royal houses often fought each other. Equally, they sought each other's support in war, often cementing alliances with marriage. Loyalty to lord and king was the cornerstone of Saxon law. A man whose lord fell in battle had to fight to the death for revenge. At Alfred's birth, the dominant kingdoms of Mercia and Wessex, his father's land, were at peace. We know much of Alfred's life and times. A history of his life was written by Asa, a monk in his service. It gives many fascinating insights into his actions. Asa was an important monk at St. David's Monastery in South Wales. In his Life of King Alfred, he recalls his journey to the king. I was summoned by the king from the remotest part of West Wales and I journeyed to the Saxon land. After I had decided to cross the vast tracts of land, I traveled to the territory of the South Saxons, which is called Sussex. I first saw the king there at the royal estate of Dean. 
After I had been welcomed most warmly by him, the king asked me to become a member of his household. King Alfred's early life was dominated by two violently opposed factors. Firstly, the influence of the Christian church, and secondly, the incursions of Viking invaders. The monasteries were vital centers in the drive to spread the Gospels. Not only that, they were great teaching and scholastic institutions encouraging book writing and making. The libraries painstakingly assembled in the monasteries inspired monks to study. It was paramount for books to be translated into the native language and for the monks to be taught to read. Often monks would act as tutors to the sons of nobles. As a child, Alfred was swiftly educated in the Christian faith. His mother, Queen Osbach, used to read psalms, prayers and poetry to him and his four elder brothers. According to his biographer, Asa, Alfred was brought up exclusively at court and was a favorite child. He would have spent much of his life on the move as his father, King Ethelwulf, traveled between royal lodges. The Kingdom of Wessex had expanded eastwards to include Kent, Essex, Surrey and Sussex. To control all this land, the king had to stay on the move. Later in his life, King Alfred was to recall with regret his childhood travels. His parents were unable to find a tutor to teach him to read and write. But his enthusiasm for learning and his quick memory served the young Alfred well. One day, his mother was showing Alfred and his brothers a poetry book. She said, I will give this book to whoever learns it the quickest. Alfred spoke in reply, Will you really give it to the first of us to learn and recite it to you? Whereupon, smiling, she said, Yes, I will. Encouraged by this and attracted by the beauty of the initial letter of the book, Alfred took the book to his teacher. When he had learned it, he took it back to his mother and recited it. The Vikings were a ferocious race skilled in the arts of sailing and warfare. With the shallow draft of their longboats, they could penetrate deep inland by river. The sudden arrival of the dragon-proud ships struck terror into the hearts of the Anglo-Saxon people. From their bases in Denmark and Norway, Viking warlords led their fleets to the rich pickings of Christian Europe. Nowhere was safe from their savage raids. The Vikings' terrifying reputation in battle led armies to melt before them. But where possible, the Vikings aimed at easier targets. Rich farming communities and the religious houses they bequeathed their wealth to were the Vikings' favorite. Murdering the unarmed monks, the Vikings would steal all they could find. What they could not take, they burned. The Viking raiders left a trail of destruction in their hit-and-run attacks. The isolated monasteries established by the Christian missionaries in northern England were left in ruins. By the time of Alfred's birth, the Viking raids had taken on a more worrying dimension. In 851 AD, when Alfred was three years old, a Viking army wintered in England. This was a major development, signaling a new intention amongst the Vikings. Instead of raiding, they now decided to conquer and settle. From their winter base on the Isle of Sheppey and the River Thames, they struck out. Joining forces with another Viking host, the raiders ransacked Canterbury. They then swung north to successfully attack and pillage London, cutting a swathe of blood and fire as they went. The King of Mercia hastily assembled his army to drive off the Vikings. However, by a swift march, the Vikings surprised him and put his whole army to flight. With the Mercian army defeated, the Vikings looked about for fresh opportunities to plunder. The monk Asa, in his life of King Alfred, takes up the story. After these things had passed, the Viking host marched on Surrey, a district to the west of Kent, on the southern bank of the Thames. 
Ethelwulf, king of the Saxons, and his son Ethelbald, with all their men, fought at a place called Oakfield for a long, long time. When battle had been fought fiercely uh, there by both sides, a large number of the Viking army lay dead and destroyed. Such was the extent of their losses that such slaughter had never before been recorded. The Christians honorably won the day and were masters of the battlefield. In the same year, Athelstan and Elderman Ilhir massacred a great Viking army at Sandwich in Kent. Nine of their ships were taken. What remained of their fleet fled. Such defeats inflicted by the West Saxons on the Vikings provided vital breathing space. King Ethelwulf must have known that his victories were only temporary. Over the sea, more fleets were being prepared and weapons sharpened. King Ethelwulf could defeat a Viking army in a day. The destruction they wrought took years to make good. Many monasteries were blackened and gutted and many abbots and monks dead. The survival of Christianity itself hung in the balance. Small wonder then that Alfred's parents could not find a tutor to teach him to read. In later years, King Alfred was to recall. Remember what punishments befell us then, at this time, when we did not appreciate learning and teaching. We were only Christians in name, without Christian virtues. I remember, before everything was ransacked or burnt, the churches of this land were full of books and treasures. Also, there were many men and women in the service of the Lord. King Ethelwulf did not only face danger from outside his kingdom. In 855 AD, when Alfred was seven, Ethelwulf took him to Rome once again. On Ethelwulf's return to England, he received disquieting news. During his absence, his son Ethelbald and his supporters had conspired to prevent Ethelwulf from resuming his kingship. At such a crucial time, a civil war between father and son would have been a disaster. Asser recorded his distaste at the confusion. While King Ethelwulf was abroad, a disgraceful incident against the practices of all Christian men occurred. King Athelbald, the Bishop of Sherborne, and the Ealdorman of Somerset plotted to prevent King Athelwulf from taking up his royal throne. Many say this wretched deed, unheard of in previous times, was encouraged by the Bishop of Ealdorman. But there are many who blame King Athelbald's arrogance because he was greedy in this and in other of his misdeeds. This grasping and iniquitous son ruled whereby right the father should have. An agreement was quickly concluded. King Ethelwulf would be ruler of the eastern kingdoms of Kent, Surrey and Sussex. Ethelbald would reign over the western part of Wessex. In 864, when Alfred was 16, the Vikings wintered once more in Kent. They concluded a peace treaty in exchange for gold with the men of Kent. However, as soon as this was done, the Vikings broke the treaty and laid waste to eastern Kent. Whilst Alfred was learning to read and hunt, a life or death struggle was happening around him. When Alfred was 18, his elder brother Ethelred inherited the throne of Wessex. It happened that Ethelred succeeded to the throne. I asked him, before all our counsellors, to divide our inheritance and give me what was mine. He told me that this could not easily be done. Then he promised that at his death he would leave me whatever he held for us and whatever else he might gain. This I readily agreed to. But at this time the heathens came once more to conquer our land. King Ethelred and Alfred swiftly raised armies from all parts of Wessex. This was done by dispatching messengers to the chief nobles, eldermen of each kingdom. 
The elderman raised the feared, or local army, by summoning the lesser nobility. The more land a noble had, the more men he had to provide. Once assembled, the army was dispatched to Nottingham. The Vikings had taken up a strong defensive position within Nottingham. As the Mercians and Saxons could not breach the defences, a peace treaty was established. Ethelred and Alfred took their forces back to Wessex. The Vikings withdrew back to Northumbria to winter in the city of York. No side had gained any real advantage and no lasting peace could be possible. In 870 AD, the Viking army left York. Passing through Mercia, it entered the Kingdom of East Anglia. In a fierce battle, King Edmund of the East Angles was killed and his army defeated. The Vikings rapidly subjugated the entire kingdom. With much of Northumbria and all of East Anglia in their control, the Vikings looked triumphantly towards Wessex. Viking influence in England had reached a dangerous point of expansion. Northumbria and East Anglia were under Viking power. Kent and Mercia were vulnerable to attack and had tried to buy peace. Wessex was still largely untouched by the raiders. If it fell, the plunder opportunities would be great. In 871 AD, the Viking leader Halfdan determined on a plan to strike at the heart of his enemies. First, his land force rode to Reading to establish a stronghold. Then, his fleet with supplies and reinforcements sailed up the Thames. He could now strike south or west using the River Thames and River Kennet. Halfdan's plans went well initially. Reading was taken and a moat and rampart swiftly constructed to secure the Viking base. Halfdan knew that Saxon scouts would have followed his march. He prepared his forces for the inevitable Saxon onslaught. Sure enough, Ethelred and Alfred were energetically assembling their forces within striking distance. When Halfdan sent out a force to forage and scout, they encountered a Saxon army and were defeated. Their morale at fever pitch, the Saxon forces advanced on the Viking stronghold at Reading. The battle was hard, prolonged and bloody. Despite their determined efforts, the Saxons were unable to storm the ferociously defended ramparts. When the Vikings burst out of their stronghold in a bold counter-attack, the Saxons broke and fled. Viking military expertise had triumphed. Both Alfred and his brother escaped the carnage. They both now desperately set about reorganizing their armies before the Vikings could exploit the fruits of victory. Incredibly, within four days, the Saxons had assembled a fresh army to threaten Halfdan. The Viking forces had left Reading to attack the rich monastery at Abington. The Saxon army intercepted them at Ashdown. Alfred's biographer Asa recalled vividly the ensuing conflict. Alfred and his forces reached the field sooner and in better order than his brother. King Ethelred was still in his tent at prayer. The faith of the Christian king counted for much with our Lord God, as shall be illustrated by what follows. Alfred could not confront the enemy's shield wall any longer without retiring or attacking before his brother reached the field. He finally deployed the Christian forces against the enemy even though the king had not come. Acting bravely like a wild boar and strengthened by divine assistance, he closed his shield wall in good order and attacked without delay. Despite having to attack uphill and against a superior force, Alfred's men followed him. The Vikings were caught off guard by the impetuosity of the Saxon assault, as Asa recorded with grim satisfaction. The Vikings had taken the superior position. The armies clashed where a small thorn tree grows with a great shout from all. 
One side fought wrongfully, the other for life, family, and country. Both sides fought resolutely and fiercely to and fro until, by divine judgment, the Vikings were no longer able to withstand the Christian onslaught. One of two Viking kings, five earls, and many thousands of Vikings were cut down and the army put to flight until they reached the stronghold whence they had come. The Christians pursued them until darkness fell, killing all they found. The victory at Ashdown established Alfred's reputation as a brave warrior and good general. His solo attack on the Viking army had unsettled them enough for his brother to press home the advantage. Within two weeks, the West Saxons were in action again. Fortune did not smile on them. King Ethelred and Alfred were defeated. Both armies continued to campaign, marching through Wiltshire and Hampshire. In a bloody engagement at Meryton, the Saxon army was once more bested by the Vikings. King Ethelred died soon after, possibly from wounds received in battle. At the age of 23, Alfred, youngest son of Ethelwulf, was proclaimed king. Within a month, he was once more in the field. Disturbing news had reached him that a fresh Viking army had reached English shores. Led by Guthrum, who was to be Alfred's main foe in the coming years, the Vikings marched into Wessex. King Alfred confronted the Vikings at Wilton. At first, the day seemed to go in the Saxons' favor. The Vikings retreated in the face of a determined attack. The Saxons pursued them, only to be themselves overwhelmed in turn. In the course of the year 871 AD, thousands of Saxons and Vikings had fallen. The Anglo-Saxon chronicles recorded nine major battles and an uncounted number of skirmishes. Both sides had fought to the point of exhaustion. The grievous losses they had suffered left neither side in a position to continue. Before the winter snows began, the Vikings pulled back to London. An uneasy peace descended on the beleaguered kingdom of Wessex. There was much for King Alfred to do. He had to re-establish his government over areas the Vikings had overrun. He had to reconstruct the administration to assess taxes and tributes. Most importantly, he had to rebuild his military machine as rapidly as possible. At any moment, his scouts might report a marauding Viking force. King Alfred took on the burdens of his kingdom with great fortitude. At his wedding, the king was seized by a severe illness, which plagued him incessantly by day and night for 25 years. Whenever, through the grace of our Redeemer, the illness was waning for a day or night, or even for the space of an hour, the king's terror of the accursed agony remained. The Vikings were not idle. Forcing the Mercians to pay them off in 872, the Vikings returned to Northumbria. Quickly re-establishing a puppet government there, they turned their attention south. Despite the payment of more money, or Danegeld, the Vikings swept into Mercia. By 874 AD, they had bloodily defeated the Mercians and deposed their king, Burgred. The Vikings now ruled all of northern and most of Midland England. Halfdan's army had been fighting in England for nine years. Now land was granted to those of his men who wished to settle in Northumbria. The Viking army that had arrived in 871 AD had no such peaceful intentions. They looked once more to the Kingdom of Wessex. In 874, Guthrum marched his army to Cambridge for his forthcoming assault. From 875 to 877, the Vikings twice invaded Wessex. On both occasions, they allowed themselves to be bought off. By 878, Guthrum was determined on conquest and summoned his warlords. Guthrum knew the importance his enemies attached to the Christmas festival. 
he knew that the Saxon armies would be unprepared. King Alfred's defeat and escape left his people with few choices. Although some resisted, the great majority could not. Some chose to leave Wessex and flee abroad. For most of the people, submission to the Vikings was the only option. Alfred's exile at the stronghold of Athelney lasted for five months. Yet the five months he spent in the midst of the Somerset marshes became the most famous period of his reign. The enduring myths of King Alfred come from this time and reinforce stories of his fortitude, piety, fairness and courage. The most celebrated of these stories was the burning of the cakes. In this story, King Alfred in his wretched anonymous state took refuge in a swineherd's hut. He was entrusted by the swineherd's wife to watch over some small loaves she was baking. King Alfred was so preoccupied with his woes that he neglected his job. The loaves were burnt and the swineherd's wife scolded him bitterly. Over the centuries, the story was embellished to show the king's humility and fortitude. The other tale further reinforces the widely held belief in King Alfred's personal bravery. Depending on the version, King Alfred alone, or accompanied by a single faithful servant, left Athelney disguised as a minstrel. He travelled to Guthrum's stronghold and gained entry. That night, he so captivated the Vikings with his singing that they persuaded him to stay. During his few days in their camp, he roamed freely amongst his enemies. When he left, he had gathered much useful information about their strength and plans. The Vikings had even paid him for his services. Whatever the truth may be, it is certain that King Alfred used his time on the run to plan carefully. Word soon spread amongst the West Saxons that their king was alive. The Anglo-Saxon devotion to loyalty to their king remained strong. Secretly, the West Saxons made their preparations. King Alfred's supporters sallied out from Athelney in a series of ambushes and attacks. Slowly but surely, the initiative the Vikings had won at Chippenham was wrested from them. In May 878, King Alfred summoned his forces to muster at Egbert's Stone. The fields of Wiltshire, Somerset and Hampshire hurried to join him. Leaving the Dorset and Devon fields to guard his rear, King Alfred's army marched. Two days later, King Alfred confronted Guthrum, who had hastily prepared a defensive position near Warminster. In the contest of arms that followed, the Saxons were victorious. Despite heavy casualties, the Vikings were able to make a fighting withdrawal to Chippenham. Asa once again carefully recorded the events that followed. King Alfred boldly made camp in front of the Viking stronghold with his army. After he had been there for 14 days, the Vikings, totally worn out by hunger, cold, fear, and in finally despair, sued for peace. Alfred could take as many hostages as he chose and give none in return. Never before had the heathens made peace under such terms. In addition, they swore they would leave the kingdom at once. Also, Guthrum promised to embrace the Christian faith and receive baptism from King Alfred's own hand. All the promises the Vikings made, they kept. Three weeks later, Guthrum and 30 of his best men were baptized, and Alfred received him as an adoptive son. Guthrum remained 12 days with Alfred, and Alfred bestowed gifts of treasure upon him. In the year of our Lord's incarnation, 879, the Viking army left Chippenham as promised. King Alfred's victory over Guthrum and Guthrum's subsequent baptism marked a turning point in the history of Wessex. The pressure on King Alfred's government was eased. From having to battle simply to survive, Alfred was able to focus on the consolidation of his kingdom. There was much to do. A measure of Alfred's success 
is that shortly after his victory at Chippenham, a Viking army landed in Kent and then left for the continent. Stories of his martial prowess did much to deter potential invaders. King Alfred had learned from the Vikings about the advantages of fighting from a stronghold. One of his first projects was an expanded building program. There were many ruined towns, royal palaces and religious houses that needed reconstruction. In addition, King Alfred established a series of new fortified sites on the Wessex borders. Each site was carefully chosen. Use was made of existing forts from Roman times or Iron Age earthworks. Significantly though, the defence system rested on fortified towns. Known as burgs, these frontier towns were the backbone of Alfred's military thinking. If Wessex was invaded, the people could flee to the nearest burg and wait for a relieving army. The military system which Alfred had inherited had proved inadequate to deal with surprise Viking attacks. King Alfred therefore reorganized the feards, dividing each in half. Half the men were released to return to their land, whilst half remained in arms. Those men still in arms served as garrisons for the burgs or in King Alfred's standing army. After a fixed period, these men were released and others returned. King Alfred had recognized the importance of a system that allowed for aggressive defense of his kingdom. He had a further innovation to protect his people. Alfred had observed how Viking raids were usually a combination of land and seaborne forces. He set about the design and construction of a navy. Alfred designed his own ships, powerful and purpose-built to outweigh the longships. In naval engagements, the Saxons would have the advantage of larger crews and higher fighting platforms over the Vikings. The king's plans cost money and manpower. His system of fortified towns supported by garrisons was suited to an agricultural community tied to the land. However, there was, Asser records, some resentment amongst his people at increased taxation. More seriously, Asser records that the vital task of building defensive works was often neglected. King Alfred had a hard time ensuring his royal commands were obeyed, but as Asser stated, By gently instructing, cajoling, urging, ordering and sharply chastising, the authority of his whole kingdom is seen to be invested to his will, to the benefit of the whole realm. But if, despite the king's reprimands, his commands remain unfulfilled because of laziness or because fortifications were started too late, then those at fault were reduced to virtual extinction as enemy forces poured in. King Alfred's defense plan was achieved over many years. However, once the building was underway, Alfred turned to another vital task. The years of strife had created a cultural desert. Few monks were able to read, and the skill of making books was virtually unknown. Worst of all, there were no scholars who could translate Greek and Latin. King Alfred was determined that anyone who held a royal office should be able to read. This desire was not inspired by Christian zeal alone. If the king's servants could read, he could send them written orders and receive written reports. King Alfred sent letters into Mercia to summon to him four scholars. Werferth, later Bishop of Worcester, Plegmund, later Archbishop of Canterbury, Werewolf and Athelstan. King Alfred himself was still learning to read. He showered gifts upon the scholars at his court. However, he was still not satisfied. He had sent letters to important churchmen on the continent asking their advice. Two monks, Grimbald and John, were recommended to him and by 886 AD they were established in England. Finally, King Alfred summoned Asa from his monastery at St David's in Wales. The result of this sudden influx of learning became apparent in 887 AD when, Asa recalls, King Alfred learnt to read and translate. 
King Alfred resolved, with the help of his scholars, to produce general translations of selected Latin works. The first Alfred undertook personally was Pope Gregory's pastoral care. In the preface to his book, King Alfred was at pains to explain his reasons for writing. I would have it known that often I have wondered at what learned men there were once in this land, and how there were happy times then, and how people from abroad came to England seeking wisdom, whereas now if we seek wisdom we must seek it outside our land. Learning had declined so thoroughly in England that there were few men who could understand divine services in English, let alone translate from Latin into English. Thanks be to Almighty God that we now have any teachers at all. So I beseech you, as often as you can, apply yourself to that wisdom God gave you. Remember how we were punished when we did not value learning or teaching others. I then began to translate this book into English as best I could understand it. I intend that each bishopric in my kingdom shall have a copy, so that all free-born young men may be set to learning it until they can read English properly. The choice of books King Alfred had translated reflected his personal concerns. They were not exclusively religious. A book of cures and remedies, a leech book, was translated. Bede's famous History of the English Church and a book of English saints were translated from Anglian dialect into Saxon. King Alfred also turned his energies to education. A school was established within the royal household for the sons of nobles. By the late 880s, King Alfred had three children of his own, two daughters and a son. The function of the school was to teach reading and writing. Alfred's own translations were studied. As well as providing his successors with literate administrators, the king wanted to provide the church with literate candidates for holy orders. The suffering the church had endured during the Viking onslaught was visible to all. Alfred financially supported the existing monastic buildings throughout his reign. He also founded two new religious houses. The first was a monastery constructed at Altheny to thank God for his victory. The second, a nunnery, was constructed at Shaftesbury. His daughter, Ethel Gifu, was made abbess. Alfred set his monks to work, busily copying books and manuscripts to provide for these new establishments. King Alfred's unflagging support for the church brought additional benefits. The neglected arts and crafts of sculpting, carving, jewelry making and book decoration were relearnt. King Alfred himself was a keen patron of craftsmen. As king, he was expected to reward loyal servants. The king commissioned intricate jewels, fine cloaks and other treasures. In the peace and security of Wessex, the people slowly erased the destruction of war. Having attained a degree of stability, King Alfred began to consider expansion. The success of Alfred's kingship was already producing allies. By 886 AD, the kingdoms of South Wales were abandoning their traditional alliances and seeking Alfred's overlordship. In return for submitting to King Alfred's rule, these kingdoms received his military protection. The Kingdom of Mercia petitioned King Alfred to protect them and accepted his lordship. While this was happening, Alfred was planning carefully. Although his kingdom was enjoying relative peace, the Vikings were still active. In 885 AD, a Viking army crossed from Europe to Kent. Marching swiftly, they laid siege to Rochester. The local people took shelter within the town's walls and waited. The Vikings busied themselves constructing siege works, but before they were able to capture Rochester, disaster overtook them. King Alfred's army arrived so rapidly and in such numbers that the Vikings abandoned their stronghold, captives and horses and fled. The success of the Berg system must have boosted Saxon morale. The Vikings fled back to France, although some headed north into East Anglia. King Alfred therefore determined to recapture London from the Vikings. If he could capture London, he would be able to safeguard the roads and waterways into southern England. 
Little is known of Alfred's campaign against London. What is known is that after a brief and bloody struggle, the city fell to his forces. Immediately, Alfred ordered the construction of two bergs straddling the Thames at Southwark. This effectively denied the Vikings access inland. King Alfred's military successes were backed up with sound diplomacy. London had been in Mercian territory. King Alfred returned it to Mercian control, marrying his daughter, Athelflaeld, to the Mercian leader. King Alfred used his strong position to negotiate a fresh treaty with Guthrum. Alfred was now recognized as ruler by the peoples of Wessex, Mercia and Wales. Between 886 and 890, Alfred concluded an agreement which established Anglo-Saxon and Viking territories. The Dane law, an imaginary line, divided the two spheres of influence. Running up the Thames to the River Lee, the Dane law then followed the Lee to its source. From the Lee, the line went to Bedford and followed the River Ouse to Watling Street. The Dane law then followed the old Roman road to Chester. All land to the north and east of the Dane law was deemed to be under Guthrum's control. All land to the south and west was under the rule of King Alfred. Alfred's territorial success was obvious. As Asa claimed, all Angles and Saxons willingly submitted to King Alfred's rule. King Alfred's authority was a unifying factor for the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. To further unify his kingdoms and to demonstrate his royal power, King Alfred embarked on two new projects. In the early 890s, King Alfred ordered that a chronicle of the Anglo-Saxons from Roman times to his own be compiled. It emphasized their common heritage from early Christian times. It also stressed how the West Saxon kings had assumed control by divine wish. King Alfred's second project was even more far-reaching. He had committed to record his code of law. First, we enjoin what is of most importance, that a man be bound by his pledge and oath. If anyone is compelled by oath to an evil act such as treason or treachery, it is better they leave the act undone. However, if a man is pledged to a deed he does not fulfill, he must hand all his possessions to his friends and humbly submit to prison for 40 days at the king's estate. If a man refuses to go to prison and has to be forced, he forfeits his possessions. If he escapes, he is to be outlawed and excommunicated. The making of laws established the king's desire for peace and justice. As well as capital offences, Alfred developed the system covering punishment by fine and compensation to victims. If any man plots against the king's life, or supports fugitives or the king's enemies, he is to pay with his life. If any man fights or draws weapons in the king's hall, the king is to have judgment of life or death over him. If anyone openly ignores the church's law during Lent without permission, they must pay compensation of 120 shillings. If any man disturbs a public meeting by drawing a weapon, the fine is 120 shillings to his elderman. I, Alfred, King of the West Saxons, showed my councillors these laws, and they were happy to agree to them. As king, his duties were widespread, overseeing his court, household and government. King Alfred also attended judicial hearings, received foreign diplomats, planned new buildings, and still somehow found time to hunt. However, his oath to divide his time equally between his god and his kingdom presented a problem. There was no way that the daylight and night hours could be measured. King Alfred came up with a solution. According to Asa, the king ordered a quantity of wax to be purchased, weighed and divided to make six candles. Each candle was 12 inches tall. King Alfred then had each candle marked at inch intervals. When lit, the candles burnt at the rate of an inch an hour, the marks providing a guide to the passing of time. 
King Alfred further instructed that the candles should be placed in lanterns made of wood and ox horn. This prevented the candles being blown out or burning too quickly in a draught. Thus Alfred was able to keep his oath to God. He took equal care in the division of his revenue. The annual revenue King Alfred gathered from taxation was divided into halves. The first half was for the maintenance of his kingdom. A third went to pay his nobles and soldiers. A third was reserved for payment of craftsmen and skilled artisans. The last third was reserved for gifts and charity. The second half of Alfred's revenue was bequeathed to the church. Divided into four equal parts, the money went to the upkeep of his school, the two religious houses he had founded, arms for the poor, and finally a general fund for the upkeep of the church. In 892 AD, Alfred's lookouts in Kent saw a familiar sight, the dreaded sails of a Viking fleet. Defeat and famine had pushed two desperate Viking armies to leave the continent and sail for England. The two fleets crossed the channel and divided. One fleet struck into southern Kent and embarked at Appledore. The other fleet sailed around East Kent and made landfall at Milton Regis. King Alfred's scouts followed their progress and reported their movements. Once again, King Alfred called out his army, perhaps taking solace from the psalms he had recently translated. O oh Lord, why are there so many of my enemies who afflict me? Why do so many rise up against me? Many say to my spirit, it has no protection from God. But it is not as they say. Rather, you without doubt are my shield and glory. Therefore, I do not now fear the multitudes of the enemy, although they surround me. For you, O oh Lord, arise and make me safe. Unfortunately, accounts of what followed are confusing. Alfred led his army into Kent and took up position near Rochester. From here, he could see the Vikings' fortified position at Milton. Alfred's son Edward was entrusted with an army to watch over the Vikings in South Kent. A stalemate ensued, with neither side willing to commit itself to battle. King Alfred, seeing this, attempted a diplomatic solution. He opened negotiations with the Viking leader, Haston. In exchange for a large sum of gold, Haston agreed to take his forces beyond the Danelaw. To cement the agreement, Haston's two sons were baptized under Alfred's sponsorship. By Easter 893 AD, the Vikings in North Kent had sailed to the shores of Essex. The Vikings in South Kent now divided. The fleet put to sea to sail to East Anglia. A mounted force of warriors made a raid through Kent, aiming to pick up booty and cross into the Danelaw. By the time they reached Farnham, Alfred's son Edward was almost upon them and anxious to prove himself. As soon as he could, Edward attacked. In the vanguard, Edward's bravery inspired his men. The Vikings fell back in confusion. They left behind all their plunder and prisoners. During the battle, the Viking leader was wounded. The Vikings managed to withdraw to Thorny Island in the Thames. Edward's victorious army was quick to follow up its advantage. The Vikings, to their despair, found themselves surrounded. King Alfred's army was approaching from the west. The Vikings were trapped. Incredibly, the Vikings were able to escape. King Alfred had received word that a Viking army was attacking Devon. He immediately turned all his forces westward to counter the threat. Meanwhile, Edward's army left the siege, having served their allocated time in the army. The Vikings retired into Essex. The Viking attacks in the west petered out without a major engagement. King Alfred launched assaults across the Danelaw into Essex, defeating the Viking army and destroying their stronghold at Benfleet. By changing the style of Saxon defence 
and launching attacks against Viking strongholds, King Alfred negated the effect of Viking raids. While he could not stop the Vikings from entering his kingdom, once in, he could quickly contain them. By 896 AD, the Vikings had had enough. Once more, they set their sails for the continent and left for easier victories. King Alfred was now 47. He had three more years to live. Right to the last, King Alfred was still studying and translating. He died aged 50 on the 26th of October, 899. The significance of King Alfred's reign was not evident to the Anglo-Saxons. His achievements gradually came to be recognized during the Middle Ages. King Alfred became all things to all men, a romantic hero, father of the navy, founder of the English state, creator of English law. His heroic stand against the Vikings was held up as a mirror to princely behavior. It was not until the 16th century that he became known as Alfred the Great, and from then on, his place in English history was assured. A thousand years after his death, King Alfred was a Victorian schoolboy hero. To the modern world he is remembered, if at all, as a king who burnt some cakes. What King Alfred would have made of his future popularity, we cannot know. Surviving documents he wrote give us glimpses of a man committed to his God, his law, his people and his children. We are left with a curious picture of a man who would lead his warriors into a ferocious battle one day and spend hours studying a Latin text the next. A chronicler descended from his brother wrote the following in the late 10th century. Perhaps in these few words, we have a measure of King Alfred's greatness. In the year of our Lord 899, there passed from this world King Alfred of the Saxons, unshakable pillar of the people of the West, a man full of justice, active in war, wise in speech, studied in sacred literature over all things, for he translated unknown numbers of books from Latin to his own tongue, with such variety and skill that not only scholars, but any who could, might hear it read. The king died on the seventh day before all saints, and his body rests in peace at Winchester. Only say, reader, Redeemer Christ, save his soul. <laughs>